This video is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Some quote Joseph Stalin as having said, It is necessary to learn to fight with little blood, but with the large expenditure of shells. Given that artillery was usually responsible for somewhere between 50 and 70% of casualties during a battle, this was of the utmost importance. The Soviets were known for their ability to concentrate massive amounts of artillery during operations. However, the Soviets also fired fewer shells by weight on average when compared to the Americans or the Germans, which has interesting implications. In this video, we're going to look into the basics of Soviet artillery organization and how it was employed operationally and tactically. This will be a multi-part series. In next week's video, we will compare the Soviet artillery to American and German practice. Further, we will offer an analysis and critique of Soviet practice and its limitations. First, let's go over the basic organization of the Soviet Red Army's artillery forces in the second half of the Great Patriotic War. Note that this is going to be basic info because we have a lot to get through. If you'd like a video that delves deeper into the nitty gritty of how specific artillery units were organized, let me know in the comments. Overall, the Soviet artillery capability was split into two basic categories, operational and tactical. Operational artillery supported an overall operation, typically through preparatory fires and targeting the depth of the enemy's defenses. Common targets for operational fires included communications, enemy reserves, command posts, and artillery batteries. This fire was usually unobserved, with targets being behind the front line and pre-planned. Targets were usually identified beforehand using aerial reconnaissance, sound range finding, or signals intelligence. Operational artillery was centralized, consisting of dedicated artillery units under the reserve of the Supreme High Command and other formations, including artillery divisions, that were organized under five artillery corps. However, not all artillery in these units were used operationally. A fair portion would have been attached to maneuver units to bolster their own artillery groups, so you can think of artillery at this level as a reserve artillery outside of maneuver units that was deployed for offensive operations. An example of an operational artillery unit was the Breakthrough Artillery Division. By September of 1944, these divisions consisted of a light brigade with 48 76mm guns, a howitzer brigade with 84 122mm howitzers, a mortar brigade with 108 120mm mortars, a heavy mortar brigade with 32 160mm mortars, a heavy howitzer brigade with 32 152mm howitzers, a BM howitzer brigade with 24 203mm howitzers, and a rocket launcher brigade with 36 Katyusha rocket launchers. A gun artillery division was another operational formation intended primarily for counter-battery fire, and it was armed with 48 76mm guns and 108 152mm gun howitzers. Meanwhile, tactical artillery was meant to support the tactical operations of maneuver units. This typically consisted of artillery guns and mortars from the rifle corps level and below. This also included artillery from the operational level that was attached to maneuver units and used tactically. As of June 1943, a Rifle Corps Artillery Regiment organically contained 16 122mm guns divided into four batteries, although half these batteries could be replaced with 152mm gun howitzers. Below them, each rifle division at the time had 12 divisional 122mm howitzers, 20 divisional 76mm field guns, 12 regimental 76mm infantry guns, 21 regimental 120mm mortars, and 83 battalion 82mm mortars each. Note that these figures ignore artillery below 75mm in caliber as well as anti-aircraft guns. For an operation, artillery would temporarily be task-organized into artillery groups at the Army, Corps, Division, and Regiment levels. This was meant to improve command and control of the artillery by giving field commanders direct control of artillery assets to support their maneuver. Soviet doctrine stated that infantry units should be supported by more than the equivalent number of artillery units, which explains why organic artillery assets were heavily reinforced with operational artillery. For example, during the Petsamo Kirkenese operation, each rifle company in the breakthrough sector received fire support from two to three artillery or mortar batteries. It also simplified organization and provided for a common command structure as artillery from multiple units would often be attached to each maneuver corps. These groups kept in touch with the commander of the maneuver unit they were under as well as the commanders of the divisional artillery. 
Citing the Petsamo Kirkinus operation in October 1944, detailed by Major James F. Gebhardt, an army artillery group consisted of long-range heavy artillery and rocket artillery to suppress the enemy and strike him in depth. Counter-battery fire was also generally the job of army artillery groups because enemy artillery batteries were deep targets and generally unobservable by tactical units. Meanwhile, a core artillery group consisted of up to two regiments of 152mm howitzers and a regiment of rocket artillery. Artillery groups at the core level and above ideally would have the support of aerial reconnaissance, including spotting balloons, to spot targets and correct fire due to them being unobservable from the ground. The composition of division artillery groups was more tactical in nature and situational depending on the division's task. Generally, they consisted of additional 122mm guns. And lastly, regimental artillery groups consisted of 1 to 2 120mm mortar battalions and 1 to 5 field artillery battalions depending on the mission. To accomplish their mission, Soviet artillery could generally be described with the following characteristics. First, it was heavily concentrated on a narrow portion of the front. Core to Soviet thinking was maximizing the number of guns to achieve the highest volume of fire in the shortest amount of time. This was not a new concept, as Georg Brokmola had recommended this based on World War I experience, which showed that long, multi-day barrages with high shell expenditure but comparatively smaller concentrations of barrels were often ineffective. Rather than spend more shells over longer periods of time, Soviets concentrated very high amounts of artillery pieces and mortars on narrow sections of a front to rapidly achieve local fire superiority and suppress targets as quickly as possible. This usually involved the concentration of at least 150 to 200 guns per kilometer of a breakthrough sector, and even more by the time of the Battle of Berlin. This tactic ultimately necessitated the attachment of extra artillery to an operation from the reserves, as the Maneuver Corps could only provide 56 to 90 guns per kilometer of front. Artillery assets were sometimes transferred from up to 1,000 kilometers away or farther for an operation, and involved cross-attaching artillery between armies. This was all done while simultaneously using deceit to make the enemy believe concentration was occurring on different parts of the front. Second, Soviet artillery was heavily centralized. Centralization allowed for effective concentration as described in point one. Additionally, it allowed for a very large number of guns to be controlled more easily. As much as 35% of Soviet artillery was reserve artillery under centralized control that could be deployed to specific operations at the front or army level. On the tactical level, the control of guns would usually be pre-planned and coordinated at the divisional level. Third, Soviet artillery was relatively lean on logistical support at the tactical level, especially at the division and below. Operational artillery generally received priority for motor vehicles, with divisions largely using horse-drawn transport. Munitions allocation was also centralized at the army level, with divisions receiving artillery ammo based on need. And lastly, Soviet artillery closely cooperated with infantry. It was said by Colonel General of Artillery Fedor Samsonov that the number of guns and shells expended during the attack phase of an operation mattered less than the timeliness of the support. This meant that tactical artillery had to travel close with the infantry and often employed direct fire to ensure its effectiveness. Soviet artillery was famous for being used in the close-range direct fire role. Guns and howitzers often used direct fire in a tactical setting, acting as multi-purpose field infantry and anti-tank guns in practice. Even big operational batteries often incorporated direct fire, with heavy artillery sometimes being used to target strongholds in the direct line of sight of batteries. Samsonov states that artillery from 45mm to 203mm in caliber, which is basically every gun excluding the less common 210mm cannons and 305mm howitzers, could have been used for direct fire depending on the survivability of the target. Historically, this doctrine was partially the result of artillery being employed in the anti-tank role, a result of dedicated anti-tank guns not being well supplied at the beginning of the war. Direct fire also had the side benefit of mitigating the effect of communications deficiencies and made artillery fire more accurate, which also allowed Soviet artillery crews to conserve ammunition. Additionally, it conserved time as targets would be destroyed or suppressed quicker with direct fire when compared to indirect fire. Generally, indirect fire was only used when direct fire was not possible, such as when targeting the enemy's rear. And even then, indirect fire batteries were positioned expecting to use direct fire in case there was an enemy breakthrough. Thus, 
Batteries would usually be placed along paths that enemy armor would likely use, with the expectation that they could be used in the anti-tank role in the defense. While tactically effective, the method was risky because it put artillery crews in harm's way. Concealment was crucial in protecting the artillery position. Batteries on the front line in plain view of German positions would often be perfectly hidden. However, in the offensive, this was not often possible, so commanders had to be intelligent with how they placed their guns on the move, taking advantage of terrain to mitigate risk. If artillery crews did come under attack and had to defend themselves, they would not be able to simultaneously provide fire support to their infantry, so it was a give and take. Tactically, it's possible that mortars were the primary indirect fire weapon of Soviet maneuver units. Hans-Georg Rickert recalled offensive operations against Soviets in 1942 and wrote that it seemed as though Soviet 82mm mortars had endless supplies of ammunition, while 120mm mortars fluctuated moderately and 76mm and 122mm artillery fluctuated heavily based on the timing of offensives. The data shows that the Soviets fired far more mortar shells than regimental or divisional gun shells. This suggests that mortars, while less important operationally, were very important tactically. It only makes sense, as mortars are cheaper to produce and more transportable than artillery pieces, incredibly hard for enemies to detect with sound ranging equipment, capable of high rates of indirect fire for short periods, and available to low level commanders which made their fires more timely. In terms of damage potential, 82mm mortars were roughly equivalent to 76mm guns, while 120mm mortars were roughly equivalent to 122mm howitzers. However, they were available one subunit below their gun equivalents and with obvious range and accuracy limitations. During normal offensive operations, mortars were generally controlled at the battalion level, while during operations in close country or urban environments they were usually passed down to the company level. By 1944, 82 and 120mm mortars accounted for 40% of all Soviet shells fired by weight and made up 60% of a rifle division's organic artillery assets. Because Soviet artillery was generally better suited to direct fire and pre-planned indirect fire rather than on-call indirect fires, this could have presented problems for infantry as they advanced into the depths of the enemy defense. This problem would have been even more pronounced if the Germans utilized elastic defense tactics, which involved abandoning forward positions and strong points that were being targeted for a second line of defense that was generally in a more advantageous position. This could partially explain one Soviet lessons learned report after Operation Bagration that stated preparatory artillery had failed to adequately suppress or destroy German positions in their depth. Inadequate suppression in depth made operations more costly for attacking infantry. Artillery batteries would have to be highly reactive to engage enemy defenses in depth as attacking infantry approach them, and attacking infantry would have to be casualty tolerant and aggressive enough to retain their momentum. Given that German batteries were in depth and Soviet suppression in depth was sometimes lackluster, there was a high risk of incurring heavy casualties and losing momentum if infantry was not aggressive enough or artillery was not flexible enough. As stated by Samsonov, the only quick and sure way to eliminate the consequences of enemy artillery shelling is to accelerate the pace of movement forward. The closer to the line of contact with the enemy, the less danger from his shelling. This must be firmly learned by the infantry. The basis of the Soviet offensive doctrine was that infantry and cavalry were the principal means of taking key terrain, breaking through the enemy line, and exploiting that breakthrough. Artillery could not do this, and it was acknowledged that even tanks could only hold ground temporarily absent of infantry. Consider that by the end of the war, rifle corps outnumbered tank and mechanized corps by 4.6 to 1. Further consider that these tank and mechanized corps were actually closer to division strength, being composed principally of brigades, while rifle corps were composed of multiple rifle divisions. With this in mind, we will mainly be discussing artillery and its role supporting infantry offensives. We may do a video in the future that covers self-propelled artillery in armor units specifically. Soviet artillery generally performed three primary functions during an offensive. First, providing preparatory fires before an attack. Second, supporting units during an attack. And third, supporting the advance of units through the depths of the enemy's defense. Preparatory barrages were relatively short, at least when compared to early World War I, but violent. During offensives, the vast majority of artillery shells were spent on the first day, and the majority of these were spent during the initial preparatory fire phase. It was specifically noted that preparatory barrages must take place on the same day as the attack and give enough daylight for the infantry to complete their tasks, which could take around 5 hours. 
Shorter barrages quickly followed by attacking forces allowed the attacker to retain some of the surprise advantage as the defender would not have enough time to mobilize its reserves to meet the offensive. At the same time, a high rate of fire within that time was necessary to adequately suppress and partially destroy the enemy's defenses. Enemies had to be blinded as close to the assault as possible to protect attacking infantry. Firing positions also had to be suppressed or destroyed to minimize casualties, and the enemy's communications, command, and movement of their reserves had to be disrupted to prevent a substantial counterattack. As the attackers were very vulnerable as they approached the main line of resistance, this quality was of the utmost importance to minimize losses. They usually took in the realm of one to two and a half hours, although this was sometimes extended to up to three and a half hours in one case where the attackers had to cross a river. Artillery preparation usually consisted of three periods. First was the fire raid period, which was a short period of rapid, high density fire throughout the depth of the enemy's tactical zone and lasted about 10 to 15 minutes. It had the goal of taking the enemy by surprise and out in the open, inflicting as much damage as possible before they could take shelter. Following the fire raid was the destruction period, which involved the destruction of enemy firing points and obstacles, often through direct fire or regimental mortars. This usually lasted for about 30 minutes to an hour, although it could be shorter if direct fire was employed. The target had to be observable to be considered a destruction target, thus these would usually be tactical targets close to if not on the front line, rather than targets in depth. Lastly it was the suppression period. This period was intended for area denial to achieve a demoralizing effect and keep the enemy's heads down, which would prevent them from detecting and engaging attacking forces. This period was similar to a fire raid, but with a lower rate of fire and fire density. These periods were employed in various patterns and timings depending on the operation, both to fit mission profile and to make the timing of the offensive less predictable. Generally, it was advisable for artillery preparation to continue until the attacking infantry approached the enemy to ensure the defenders remain suppressed. Afterwards, the shelling would transition into the depths of the enemy's defense. Broadly speaking, the German front line usually consisted of an outpost zone, followed by a battle zone and a rearward zone, which would include artillery batteries. Ideally, the battle zone would be situated on a reverse slope. As the war progressed, these German defenses incorporated trench networks, partially explaining the rapid increase in Soviet use of mortars. In Samsonov's artillery offensive, 120mm mortars and regimental guns used in direct fire mode are cited as ideal weapons for partially destroying enemy trench networks. Following strikes on the first line and the initial infantry assault, artillery would be used to comb the area between the first and second line of trenches in the enemy's defense network to counter elastic defense tactics. This had the aim of weakening retreating forces, preventing counterattack from the second line, and obscuring the second line's line of sight. Artillery would keep walking forward as the attackers progressed, waiting until the last possible moment to keep the immediate threat suppressed for as long as possible. As the attack progressed into the enemy's depth, company, battalion, and regimental artillery had four key tasks. First, to destroy retreating troops near attacking infantry. Second, to destroy enemy rear guards and their weapon positions. Third, to suppress or destroy enemy strongholds and centers of resistance. And lastly, to destroy counterattacking enemy forces including tanks and self-propelled artillery. As the attackers continued to advance into the depth of the defense, timeliness of artillery was paramount. Artillery crews were expected to independently engage targets of opportunity without waiting for orders from a higher echelon to do so. Situations could prove to be unpredictable once deep in the enemy's defense zone. Thus, clear command and control of artillery by tactical commanders, good communications, forward observation, and the effective use of infantry support guns as escorts was crucial. Guns would typically be attached to subunits for this purpose. For example, one third of a regiment's organic guns could be allotted to each battalion to enhance their immediate support capability. In order to keep up with the advancing infantry and limit the downtime that was caused by moving, artillery platoons were typically paired so that they could do bounding moves. In other words, while one artillery platoon fired in support of infantry, the other advanced. Additionally, it is mentioned in the regulations on the mortar company for 1942 that once the infantry had broken through the first line of defense, the mortar company had to quickly advance so that they could effectively engage deeper into the enemy's defenses. Because of the initiative required and the complexity of fire and maneuver of the batteries, the escort groups were ideally commanded by an officer and would have their own observer to spot targets in the group's vicinity. And that does it for part one of our Soviet artillery analysis. 
Stay tuned for part two, where we'll compare Soviet artillery practice to that of the US Army in Europe and Germany, and go over the strategic and operational limitations that restricted it. And now for a quick shout out to our patrons. If you want to support us even when we get demonetized and get some perks like exclusive wallpapers, early access to videos and scripts, and access to patron-only chat on our Discord, consider becoming a patron. Link is in the description. We're also going to start donating 5% of our ad and Patreon revenue to charity, so just watching our videos and subscribing will help us out with that. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.